mixed frigid snow, massive air, and we got a bleeder of a bloody nose, and you get the Winter Dew Tour. <laughs> Young Guns, big controversy, and surfing's most celebrated athlete earns a milestone achievement, and he had to do it twice. It's all your action sports news all in one place. Let's go inside Ally Sports. I'm not really scared, like, like I'm gonna get hurt of any stop on tour. Sean White went the biggest I've ever seen anyone go in the half pipe on a backset air on his first hit. Did someone say contest? Uh, Gabriel Medina won two events. I, I hear you. 17 years old. Right. Why? Welcome everyone to Inside Ally Sports. I'm Pat Parnell. Yes, you are. I'm Angela Sun. Each week we're bringing you inside the hottest stories, stats, and surprises from the world of action sports. The Dew Tour has grown in both size and spectacle since its inception. The 2012 Tour kicked off at the Nike Open in Breckenridge, Colorado. And the athletes came face to face with the most massive pipe in tour history. The perfect pipe wasn't so friendly, however, to the Friends crew who had a lot of trouble finding their rhythm. In his first full season since his back injury, Danny Davis barely got his run started before going down on the first wall. U.S. Snowboarding Grand Prix winner Luke Matrani begins his run, then takes a hit in almost the exact same spot as Davis. Olympic bronze medalist Scotty Lego came out swinging and looked like he was going to be the one to beat with a clean, powerful run. But he too went down, effectively ending the day for the Friends crew. More than ready to fill the void was Russian-born Swiss national Yuri Polachikov, better known thankfully as iPod. He gets off to a rocking start on his first run, clean out of the gate up top, then answers that with a double cork 1260 backside, and not one, but two double cork 1080s at the bottom. However, he goes down face first into the ice, leaving himself bloodied and his mind more than a little dizzy. But he doesn't stay down for long. He kills it big in his second run, keeping him in the fight. Opens with a frontside 1080 midsection, and then seals the deal with an alley-oop 540. Defending Duke Cup champion Louis Vito was mentally and physically prepared for the event after spending the summer working with Apollo Ono's trainer. He was back to his signature style, solid and technical. Tiny Dancer upping his game on the height factor, doing well, finishing off the run with a double cork 1080, cab double 10, and frontside 1080. Oh, and then the front nine for good measure. Vito finished the day with two clean runs, good enough to surge ahead of iPod. But nobody is safe when Sean White is in the building, and especially on his board. There is a reason Sean is one of the most well-known athletes of any type in the world, and you're about to see why. Right there, as he nails a backside air so high it defies any kind of rational description. And he's just starting to run up top. He completes and follows through backside 540 stalefish, double cork 1260. After that performance, there wasn't a fan at Breckenridge who doubted that Sean White would bring home another due to her goal. Sean killed it at Breck. Yeah. Pat, you're the expert. How much air did he actually get? 27 feet. Jeez. Has anyone ever gone higher than that? Um, I don't think so, but uh, the guy that can answer that question, uh, it's the guy who was there, right there when it happened, Todd Richards for more. So Breckenridge at the Dew Tour, what went down? This year, perfectly groomed, 22 foot high, 600 foot long super pipe. The biggest, longest to date. Top three guys, Yuri Podlachikov. My money is on him to take out Sean White. However, at this event, eh, it just wasn't a beat. Yuri went down super, super hard on an alley -oop backside rodeo and smacked his face. In second place, Mr. Louis Vito. He's got all the hard tricks on lock. He needs to be doing them 15 feet above the lip. In the number one spot, well, no surprise there, Sean White comes in and absolutely slays the half pipe. He went the biggest I've ever seen anyone go in the half pipe on a backset air on his first hit. Now, we're talking biggest ever. His biggest strength is going absolutely massive. I mean, he's got an arsenal of double corks back to back, this, but now other people are doing his moves. The way that Sean White can separate himself from the rest of the pack is by going six to seven feet higher than everybody else. 
While the ladies at the Dew Tour were fortunate enough not to kiss the snow like iPod, there was still plenty of drama to keep them busy. First up, Xu Kai from China was the youngest competitor in halfpipe at the 2010 Winter Olympics. Now 18, she confidently displayed strong control in the air with her double frontside sevens. At 30 years old, veteran Gretchen Blyler is always ready to take on new competition and old rivals. She relied on her strength and consistency, using her signature Crippler to move up past Xu Tong. Fans thought the unstoppable Kelly Clark was going to have no worries in this event, but Kelly hit a major snag right out of the gate on her first run. But you don't become world champion by getting shaken up easily, and Clark came back strong on her second run and once again took home the win. From fifth to first, what happened in that first run and how did you rebound from it? You know, I just left a little bit early heading into that cab seven and uh, when you leave early in the pipe, you miss the vert. So I, I hit the deck, tried to squeak it around and, and pull off the rest of my run, but it definitely wasn't going to do it. So put the pressure on myself and was able to step up to the second run and come back for the win. Olympic gold medalist Kelly Clark is on a win streak that is leaving her alone at the top. Let's talk to analyst Todd Richards to find out more on Kelly and the rest of the women's field. And on the women's side of things, the big story for me has to be this new crop of riders coming out of China. Zhu Kai came in and basically just threw down. Are the Chinese just basically training gymnasts as snowboarders? I don't know. In second place, America's sweetheart, Miss Gretchen Blyler, coming out of Aspen, Colorado. Now, you talk about someone having the complete package of marketability in snowboarding. It's definitely Gretchen, and she rips. But someone who has absolutely been on a tear has got to be Kelly Clark. A lot of people are doing the same tricks as Kelly Clark, except Kelly Clark is doing them four to five feet bigger than the rest of the field. Did everything stylishly, boom, puts it down, and another victory for Kelly Clark. The winter action continues with the next Dew Tour stop in Killington, Vermont at the Pantech Invitational beginning January 19th. It's another all-star lineup of ski and snowboard athletes and each of them are expected to pull out their most creative and sometimes dangerous tricks to battle it out for mountain supremacy. Here's a preview of what to expect. For the women's ski pipe with Jen Hudak out with a blown knee, it leaves the possible win open for Miriam Yeager and Carrie Herman. Men's pipe offers a dramatic face-off with Simon Dumont's continuing comeback against rival Kevin Rowland. And in men's ski slope, Bobby Brown could also be due for a comeback win. The men's snowboard pipe is an open field. With Sean White out of the mix, look for Luke Matrani to unleash his double Michael Chucks and go for the win. For a quick preview of the Winter Dew Tour Pantech Invitational, we once again check in with Todd Richards. What are we going to see in Killington, Vermont, the next stop of the Dew Tour? Well, big news there is Sean White will not be competing. So that opens the door for a guy like Louis Vito, for a guy like Yuri Podlachikov to come in and possibly get the victory. My vote there, if you were going to ask me, top three in men's pipe, I'm going to say Louis Vito is going to win it. iPod's either going to get top three or he's going to eat it and not even podium. Look out for a guy like Scotty Lego. Uh, and I'll just throw a wild, wild card in there. Maybe Mason Aguirre, top three. My odds on favorite, definitely, I'm going to say, is going to be Torstein Horgmo. Torstein does not like to lose. So after being defeated in Breckenridge, I think he's going to come on to the Killington stop, just absolutely swinging and wanting to take down anyone that took him out in Breckenridge. We are only getting started here on Inside Ally Sports. Coming up, we're going to check out all the action from what is arguably the most significant year in pro surfing history. Also, the latest news in skate, and we hear from this year's most anticipated surfing world tour rookie, Kalohe Andino. Stick around. Hey, I'm Todd Richards. Welcome to my office. And I'd like to remind you to subscribe to the Ally Sports channel on YouTube where you'll find the latest up-to-the-minute action sports content posted daily. On Inside Ally Sports, hosts cover the biggest stories in action sports from all over the globe, with analysis from experts in surf, skate, snowboarding, BMX, and pretty much anything else that races, rides, or flies. We'll also give you a behind-the-scenes take of these unique athletes and their lifestyles. We go beyond the competition and see the fun, creativity, and innovation that fuels their passion. Whatever you do, don't even think about missing Awesome on Ally, hosted by a pretty awesome, slightly older guy named Todd Richards. This is where the magic happens. And you get to come with me and be part of the action. 
It's the Ally Sports Channel on YouTube. Get online right now and subscribe. Go to www.allysports.com for more information. See all the favorite action sports videos right here. All right, so 2011 may have already faded away, but it's still going to be remembered as one of the most exhilarating and controversial years of surfing in World Tour history. Yep, for men surfing, progression was the name of the game. Fans were treated to a wild new crop of young pros like Hawaiian John John Florence, Australian Julian Wilson, and Brazilian Gabriel Medina, all hungry to make their mark. And world champion Kelly Slater was tasked with the job of holding them off in his unrelenting pursuit of a record 11th ASP title. The level of surfing this year on tour has been unbelievable. It's been actually somewhat of a dream tour this year and it's been exciting. And the performance level was just through the roof at every event. Yeah, everyone's sort of uh, really stepping up to the plate, you know, and I think everyone realises that if they don't go mad, then, you know, they could be off. It's so fun to watch this, this next generation of kids completely reinterpret what can happen on a wave. There's just more guys surfing really good. That, that's gonna put pressure on everybody. The halfway point of the 2011 World Tour finally arrived, and with it, a first-time mid-season reshuffle in the top 34 ranked surfers. What we're doing is allowing all those surfers that are trying to come up from the upper ranks, giving them an opportunity to get onto the World Tour, not just at the end of the year, at, at different points throughout the year. I think it's a good thing. Otherwise, we have these kind of split tours. It makes sense to have one ranking pretty much every other sport in the world does. You know, we had guys that were were, were up and coming, coming up quick, you know, coming up fast, and, and it took them longer to get onto the World Tour. We wanted to get those guys on quicker. Whoa, jams it out of the lift with a little tail drift. The kid has kind of set the world on fire a little bit since he, he's made the tour. Um, and guys that weren't performing, well, they, they had to drop back and, and, you know, sharpen their tools and, and come back and, and get back on. I like to say, and the ASP are gonna find me, because I don't want to be a part of this f***ing dumb wannabe tennis tour. Kelly at the me seems just as hungry as ever for another world title. And... Oh! Kelly Slater has come out to play. He's done what he's had to do. He missed Jay Bay and he came back and uh, won Choke. Kelly Slater has stolen everyone's mojo this week. It was pretty crazy, man. Like Owen just got in this groove where him and Kelly were like destined. You couldn't stop him, you know. They had three finals in a row, and I don't think that's ever been done. It's been a pretty classic rivalry between Owen Wright and Kelly Slater. All the talk about Kelly in the world title, there's, there's a lot at stake in this event for a bunch of other guys in terms of their careers. Kelly drops in straight on the anchors, little high line barrel. He's going to barge his way out. <laughs> nice. He takes it. An 11 time world champion. They realize they're witnessing something pretty special. Got the news, Kelly Slater was pretty active on Twitter. He said, I think the calculator at the ASP World Tour must be broken. I still have to win one more heat. I'd like to apologize to the fans, and especially Kelly and Owen. What's in front of Kelly is a massive draw in uh, Miguel Pupo and Gabriel Medina. He needs to really put on a show to finally clinch his 11th world title. They're both going to be world title threats, and to be the second oldest guy and to be against a couple of the youngest guys on tour in the heat, I had to win my 11th, and I think you know, there's something pretty fitting about that. Since I was a little kid, I was like, I want to be like him, I want to be that war champ. Victory lap there for Kelly Slater. He's, uh, and did he, he made it out of that thing? Of course he did. <laughs> Kelly Slater, your 11 time world champion, and here comes the crowd. He's just accomplished everything, you know, there is in our sport. And so I'd say he's one of the greatest athletes of all time. It's a clear sign that surfing has come of age and matured as a competitive, constantly evolving world-class sport when there are more milestones, action, and controversy in 12 months than there's been in 12 years. Here's Sal Mascala and surf analyst and former world number two Brad Gerlach to run down the year in surf. You know Kelly as well as anybody can, but you also know the perspective of what it takes to really dig in and compete over the course of the season. This year, Kelly got to be challenged consistently for the first time since Andy Irons in Owen Wright. He had three classic back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back battles with him. But he also had a lot of young guys who were bringing a, a full suitcase of consistency with progressive maneuvers in Miguel Pupo, Gabriel Medina. What do you think uh, he had to do 
in order to stay engaged to really bring it and win this 11th world title. I think that he has a combination of being gifted, um, obviously, <laughs> but uh, gifted in that way and he's very efficient, so he's not damaging his body while he's doing his sport. I think his mind and his, uh, his creativity add to him being motivated to, to study the younger guys and figure out how to beat them, and then also how to, to learn some of the new moves. He needs a constant challenge for him to stay motivated doing the same thing he's been doing for 20 years. He's uh, the best ever, and uh, what I noticed this year is that he got better. A lot of uh, interesting controversy uh, up there in San Francisco for Kelly Slater's 11th World Championship. Kelly ended up suffering from premature celebration. <laughs> to me, it said about the ASP, wow, like you're the, supposed to be the governing body of this sport. And clearly there's, there's some issues. No, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> I just was like, you know, oh man, I would not like to be Brody Carr or any of those guys over there. But, um, you know, all in all, um, people make mistakes, and when you get right down to it, it's just a show. So right now, let's prognosticate. 2012, let's take a look at all those new guys. We saw some amazing surfers make their way to the top. But Gabriel Medina won two events. I hear you. 17 years old. Right. I don't see how he doesn't finish top 10. I'm looking forward to watching uh, Jordy Smith and Julian Wilson just rip the bag out of it. I think those guys are so entertaining to watch. All right, one, one kid who really stepped his game up is Kolohe and Dino. What, what kind of potential does he have? He's a real competitor and really focused on competition, really into it, and so I th think his biggest challenge will just be in confidence. I'm looking forward to seeing Owen Wright's taste of consistency. I think that the rivalry that he had with Kelly probably benefits him more against some of those younger guys. It'll be interesting to see how he uses it. And he's goofy for it. And he's goofy for it, which makes me biased. Brad? Fired up for 2012? Absolutely, Sal. I'm fired up to sit in this seat again with you soon, buddy. <laughs> Have a safe trip to Australia. Thank you very much. Night. In Rodeo. All right. Will do. All right. Back to you guys. So there is clearly a lot to look forward to this year. And just like 2011, there's always going to be some changes in the wind. Let's take a look at who's in and who's out on the 2012 World Tour. Well, first, who's in? We thought we lost CJ Hobgood in the mid-year rotation, but he made his way back to the tour. Adam Melling and Travis Logie finally earned their spots, and Kai Otten gets saved with the Surfer wildcard. Yaden Nickel was out in 2011 after an injury, and will finally be making his World Tour debut in 2012. And of course, I get stuck with the bad news. Thanks, guys. Uh, surfers we won't be seeing on the 2012 World Tour include Dan Ross, Chris Davidson, and Hawaiian Freddie Patachia. Fans are really going to miss Dane Reynolds, who brought a reckless but always progressive approach to competitive surfing. Don't worry, though. I didn't forget everybody's favorite rookie, Kolohe Andino. Imagine what it would be like. You're 17 years old, going head to head with the finest surfers on the planet. So we asked Kolohe himself how he's going to handle his inaugural ASP World Tour. I'm not really scared of scared like like I'm gonna get hurt of any stop on tour because when the waves are big and stuff, I want to charge and get big barrels and stuff. I guess the challenge of surfing, you know, spots like Steamer Lane and and Bells, those those two are probably the most two that I'd be most scared of. Playing the game and you know, Steamer Lane can go flat for 30 minutes at a time, and then Bells just seems kind of like a difficult wave to read, and you know, you really gotta like know how to surf it. Ever since I was, you know, set six, seven, it's always been my dream to be on the world tour. And um, you know, I've always wanted to be one of those guys that qualify, like you know, 16, 17, 18. But uh, once I started getting closer to it, I was like, oh, you know, maybe 19 is like a good age for for me to be on the tour. And then uh, I ended up qualifying this year. So I, when I was younger, I kind of expected myself to be there. But then once I started getting closer, I was like, eh, you know, I'll just wait till I was 19, even though I really wanted to be on the tour still. So I was I was pretty surprised, you know, that I made it. But then. If I think back, you know, it's always been my goal to qualify now, so not really. <laughs> oh, I, 
think Medina, he's done, you know, way better than anyone around his age. Obviously, he won two events out of the first four or whatever. And, uh, you know, John John skills at pipe and uh, we're insane. So, you know, it's cool. It's, it's great because it pushes me a lot and, you know, I want to be pushed, so I'm stoked. <laughs> No, no, I never, you know, Slater's records are like out of this world. If I won a world title, I'd be successful in my eyes. You know, obviously I'd want to win multiple and four and five or three or two, but, um, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to finish in the top 10 this year. <laughs> you know, one, I want to show people that I, I'm not scared and, you know, I'm, I'm not, Insanely good because I haven't had that much experience in bigger ways, but I'm not scared of them and I want to get big barrels But uh, that's one and then another you know another thing is I just want to you know train work hard And I want to go for it in my heats and you know show people what I can do All right enough suspense. It's time to check out the 2012 men's world tour schedule Two city spots are lost as Quick Pro New York and Rip Curl Search vanish from the schedule. The Santa Cruz Coldwater Classic gets an upgrade to World Tour status while surfers and fans alike are stoked about the long way to return of Fiji as a stop for the Vulcan Pro. I think we should do our next location shoot there. You're genius, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet, so don't even think about moving, clicking, or napping, or touching that screen. All right, because we've got all the latest in breaking news, plus Paul Zitzer gives us a take on the world of skate next on Inside Ally Sports. Hey, I'm Todd Richards. Welcome to my office. And I'd like to remind you to subscribe to the Ally Sports channel on YouTube, where you'll find the latest up-to-the-minute action sports content posted daily. On Inside Ally Sports, hosts cover the biggest stories in action sports from all over the globe, with analysis from experts in surf, skate, snowboarding, BMX, and pretty much anything else that races, rides, or flies. We'll also give you a behind the scenes take of these unique athletes and their lifestyles. We go beyond the competition and see the fun, creativity, and innovation that fuels their passion. Whatever you do, don't even think about missing Awesome on Ally, hosted by a pretty awesome, slightly older guy named Todd Richards. This is where the magic happens. And you get to come with me and be part of the action. It's the Ally Sports Channel on YouTube. Get online right now and subscribe. Go to www.allysports.com for more information. See all the favorite action sports videos right here. Now it's time to get you caught up with Inside News. The passing of Sean Collins in December was memorialized on January 8th in Huntington Beach. Collins was a lifelong pioneer of modern wave forecasting and the founder of Surfline, providing data not only for surfers, but for agencies from the National Weather Service to the U.S. Coast Guard. Named one of the top 25 most influential surfers by Surfer Magazine, hundreds took part in an inspirational paddle out in his honor. Sean was the brains and the brawn and the intelligence behind Surfline. As I came here, it was flat, nice, and glassy, and as soon as everything started, there's this fog rolled in, and like it, uh, the south wind blew in, and fog rolled in, and AJ goes, there's my dad, there's Sean. Sean's passion was the ocean. It was, it was swell, storms. He was always interested in, in why waves were good somewhere and why they weren't somewhere. That was his true passion, and he turned it into a living and he changed the, the face of the surfing world doing it. Ideally you want a pure swell. Now, the swell period affects how much it'll wrap over the reef or not wrap over the reef. And a lot of times it'll miss. Sean's contribution to society uh, is very difficult to measure in the fact that it changed the way that surfers went about going surfing. A paddle out is a, a special thing because when you have, you know, a thousand people paddling out to the middle of the, of the ocean to, to join hands and, uh, and celebrate someone's spirit. It's a, it's a pretty magical thing. His son's buddies stacked their surfboards on top of each other and made a little island. 
and his sons got up and stood on top of it and, and held hands. Uh, and that was, that was the moment everybody just stopped paddling and, and cheered. People like the Duke and people like Simon Anderson and stuff that I'd have to say Sean is equal if not more of an impact on surfing because what he's done and what he's created and what he's taught is going to be, it's going to last forever. As skateboarding continues to grow and develop mm -hmm. as a sport, the number of contests and the amount of prize money seem to grow right along with it. That's right. Pro skateboarder and analyst Paul Zitzer is never shy about sharing his opinions. Ever. Here's Paul's view on this week's Inside Take. Did someone say contest? Good. Because 2011 might have topped the list of all time years for contests. X Games, Money Cups, Dew Tours, Street Leagues, all trying to up the ante. The big money at these things is still heavily weighted in favor of the winners. And you might call them skateboarding's one percenters. And while this phenomenon might be sort of a scam to the second place finishers, but it makes for some pretty quality edge of the seat excitement for the rest of us 99 percenters. It's not all about the money. New formats, new courses, locations, and more than anything, seeing the pros skate live and uncut is what really makes all this contest phenomenon stuff so awesome. Now, you could debate for days whether Street League lives up to the hype or whether the X Games is too much of not such a good thing or whether Mountain Dew or the Maloofs really have anything to do whatsoever with skateboarding. But contests are here to stay, and whoever is making them happen is okay in my book. And if you really want to get worked up, just wait four years until Nija is switch big heel flipping down the double set for Olympic gold. Pat, I warned you that Paul wasn't shy about sharing his feelings. Yeah, he's loquacious, never verbose, but always accurate. It's part of his southern <laughs> charm. That's just the way we like Paul. All right, moving on. The AMA Supercross Series kicked off in January 7th in Anaheim. Ryan Villapoto raced past Chad Reed and Ryan Dungey for the win. At the second stop in Phoenix on the 14th, it was Dungey's turn to take the victory, overtaking Jake Weimer and Villapoto. Now, the big surprise so far has been the inability of fan favorite James Bubba Stewart to gain enough traction to break into the top five. On January 21st, the tour rolls into Dodger Stadium where Stewart is going to hope to go for a... Dodger dog. No, was... uh, a home run. There you go. Well mm -hmm. done. <laughs> All right, next week we are coming at you with even more inside news, events, and action. We'll be there on the inside to get the results from the Dew Tour at Killington, along with the analysis from our expert correspondents. And we'll take an in-depth look at both sides of the issue when we talk about the highly controversial mid-year rotation on the Surfing World Tour. And what would you do if Nike handed you $1 million? The impact of big money sponsorship in the world of skate. Thanks for checking us out here on the premiere episode of Inside Ally Sports, your base camp for action sports. Make sure you subscribe to Ally Sports Network and check out all the shows on the Ally Sports channel here on YouTube. This is Pat Parnell and Angela Sun for Inside Ally Sports.